All right, I should be recording now. So hello, Dr. Corpra. Uh, this will be the first of the vlogs that I'm recording. Um, doing them a little bit later than maybe I should, probably about a week later. But uh, this is for the week of September 6th, September 6th, Sunday. Um, and I've got quite a lot to touch on. Obviously, there's a little bit of a backlog, uh, as you can probably tell. But um, we've gone over what, the history of corruption. Uh, we're about to continue into human security and uh, cases and contacts and all that, as well as we went over the definitions of corruption uh, thus far. And I guess, you know, I, I had a pretty rudimentary understanding, un understanding of what uh, corruption really was uh, when all this began. You know, I... I would have identified it as bribery, nepotism, but you know I wouldn't have called it nepotism, I, cronyism, other things like that. I, I would have said, yeah, those sound like corruption to me, and yeah, it doesn't really seem like corruption like that is happening here in the United States that bad. I mean, we probably do a pretty good job of nixing it, and um, corruption like that happens in places where people forget how to pronounce it or don't know how to pronounce it or don't think about it, and Obviously, with all that we've been discussing, as well as, you know, looking into what might be our case studies, um, it's obviously not true. And something else, uh, I don't exactly know why I held this particular train of thought, but um, I kind of assumed that corruption, you know, in, in the way that we talk about it, was more of a modern thing, right? I, you know, the way that we combat it, the way that we discuss it, the way that it arises uh it's always seemed to me to be more of a modern issue than it may have been in the past i i, I don't know why i mean i'm entirely sure that i'm entirely sure that caesar and everyone else were paid off from time to time um to do whatever but something in my brain never really clicked the word corruption with all of that um and so in that same vein, going down into the philosophical understandings of, of corruption, you know, Aristotle and Plato, um, it's, it's very interesting to see how both of those formed at, I'm not entirely educated on my Greek philosophers, but at somewhat of a um, similar time, and the fact that, you know, so many theories uh, come about, you know, there was corruption as breach of duty, uh, betrayal and secrecy, inequality, um, and, you know, undermining public interest, so many other things, uh, and pork barrel legislation, you know, all of these different ways that one might say, yeah, that's corruption, but we never really codified it or codified it. Um, and... Let me see. Yeah, I, I, I believe that a majority of people would identify corruption in the forms of uh, breach of duty or betrayal and secrecy, where when something like that gets blown out of the water, you know, uh, this is something that we're kind of discussing in AML uh, since I'm taking that this semester. Um, when a case gets blown out of the water, that's corruption. You know, when somebody was going under the table trying to stop or undermine the uh, the uh, influences of the proper legal bodies. That's what that's what I imagine most people would call corruption, including myself. Um, you know, until I began looking into it in this fashion. Um, and you know, that kind of ties into some of the videos that that uh, are up here for this third week. You know. Looking into uh, Indonesia was uh, was the first one, and it, it was kind of interesting to me to see, you know, where we're getting this like developing theme of you can participate in corruption and not really know about it, not really know how to interact with it, that sort of thing. You know, where it's taboo to speak about, but it's less taboo to to do, um, and. It, all of this has 
a historical connotation to it, it seems. Um, particularly in the case of Indonesia, um, where, what was it, the, the Sakano years, where the Indonesian army was built essentially via illegal trade, um, and that legitimate military spun, spending is, you know, a third of maybe, you know, like covered a third by the national budget. The rest is um, financed by generals and contracts and illegal trade and all that. And it's kind of mind boggling that a state could be, you know, even a state's actors could be so involved in this. And it's just kind of accepted by the state because of because it's pursuing likely a national interest. You know, uh, in, in this case, the military being funded in this fashion is pursuing the national interest of um, of self-defense, self-preservation. Uh, sorry. Um, and they also let's see the the video on on Indonesia had covered um, that decision-making taken closer to the people increases the chances for corruption and patronage, but they had also said that it's not necessarily a bad thing, um, that it might help develop public interest. But, you know, as I said, with the fact that state actors are so involved in this, the that sort of influence into the into the the public might I don't know it, it seems like it could skew into the way of non-state actors being able to uh, hold something that they really shouldn't or or maintain a particular influence and that in more cases than not while it may not be a bad thing right now or or, or in particular instances. Um, that it would more often than not devolve or develop into uh, a bad thing. Um, oh, excuse me, sorry, I'm just reading my notes. Um, I also looked into the, or, you know, I've watched the, this is what winning looks like, um, Afghanistan-focused documentary. Um, and I, you know, I noticed a real Aristotle, <laughs> this word always, Aristotelian viewpoint, um, where there was really a cultural clash, you know, both between what was going on in Afghanistan as well as um, how the United States was trying to really influence otherwise. Um, that this was really a learned thing; that it wasn't inherent. Um, it was learned via culture in this particular inter in instance. Um, and it even went against what were the standard cultural norms in Afghanistan, where um, uh, respected roles were the ones committing sexual assault. You know, the, and then really it kind of began to clash upon the question of human rights versus not really being allowed to have human rights. Um, and, you know, there being a real no questions asked style of operation where, you know, I, again, another thing, it's, it's almost, uh, it's almost funny to discuss, but like, I, you know, I had known that we were in Afghanistan. I wasn't entirely sure what we were doing in Afghanistan or our military and what kind of influence we were really trying to ex exhibit. And, every, you know, everyone was always talking about oh, getting out of the Middle East and getting out of Afghanistan um, and I, I guess I never really knew that this is what we were actually doing, that we were training and trying to instill some sort of Western point of view on, on people so that they can really readily help and defend themselves and, and do it in a way that would, you know, would not be, um, would not be too heavily scrutinized by bodies outside of Afghanistan and but it, you know so much corruption just manages to pervade that regardless of what we attempt to do and this might actually end up tying into what Plato kind of thinks that oh well it really is just a part of you because they you know it's it's almost both where they've learned it 
but it's now a part of them. And, you know, this is kind of instanced in, obviously, that, you know, kind of uh, human rights and no human rights debate, the, uh, the drug influences, um, particularly that comes down to, um, to funding, really. But it's, how do I want to say this? I don't, it, it seems that, you know, after a certain point, you know, living in this particular way and, and seeing your superiors act in a particular way, you know, whether it's sexual assault or whether it's a sponsored usage of drugs, um, that kind of spawns a platonic understanding of corruption. While, while it might not be something ideal that, that he would have been talking about, um, it does seem like it wants to fade in that direction. Um... And, you know, I, I guess I want to tie back to the uh, historical direction of this because we, we did talk quite a lot about that. And I, I really wanted to talk about um, um, religion and morals about this because, it, you know, the religions each understand corruption in a particularly different way. Uh, I can't remember. I believe it was chapter five of the the book that we've been reading, the um, uh, Cockcroft book. That, that's it. I had to look for it. Um, chapter five of the Cockcroft book really went into that. Um, you know, they they evaluated uh, Confucius, Islam, Hindu. You know, so the difference there, the Judaic ones had seen corruption as a subversion of justice. Uh, Confucian was attempting to preserve the morality of the ruler. Hinduism was corruption versus society. And Islam was uh, corruption as a threat to disinterested uh, leadership, you know, a, a kind of a lazy prince. And then while they didn't uh, cover it in the book, the Western understanding or the Christian understanding, uh, kind of generalizing from what I understand, is that um, corruption is really... Uh, kind of a blight, you know, a plague on the body, uh, how, how Aristotle might understand it, where it's, it's degenerative, it's, you know, it's pulling away from, it's pulling away from what is meant to be, what's meant to be in the natural order, um, and that it's not natural, it's learned, it's, uh, it's imposed, and that kind of ties into, um, that kind of ties into this Afghani video, uh, primarily because of the Islamic, uh, the Islamic uh, overtones, I guess, where you know we're we're really seeing a disinterested uh, leadership. It seems that you know whether it's on this literal you know military base by military base cases or whether it's focusing on the leadership that would oversee the development, you know, the, the, the headquarters that would oversee the development of these Afghani men um, into people who can properly defend themselves. Uh, either way, we're looking at disinterested leadership, people who really aren't interested in trying to do better. We're looking more so at people who are... Um, People are just not trying to do better, basically. Um, and it's it's interesting that you can pick that particular one up here because this is an Islamic group kind of facing what would be an Islamic understanding of corruption. You know, it, the, it's not like they're subverting justice. There's no ruler here that we're trying to preserve the morality of. The body is not disintegrating. And society isn't exactly fighting the corruption, or at least not directly. It's more so, you know, the outside influences trying to aid against the spread of corruption in this case. Um, well, a lot of this come, you know, a lot of what we've read and looked into and watched has uh, really sparked, you know, one particular thing from me, and that's really... Um, just kind of want to, yeah. I I would love to hear, you know, what um, what these people might say in a modern sense, 
right you know the development of corruption in indonesia and development of corruption in um in afghanistan and there was a there's a third one let me see um the, the, the western balkans and you know police corruption and all these other things um because the united states is at a, a particularly different time now than when all of this was written cockcroft and the ted talk and the vice documentary where we're at such a different point where we're facing the discussion of police corruption and the entirety of the 2016 electoral campaign for donald trump or well not the entirety but a lot of it was oh we're gonna get corruption out we're gonna drain the swamp we're gonna make america great again um and you know really i i just kind of like to look and see what these experts may have said now um which i'm sure i could find with a, a little bit a little bit more effort but that's kind of where i'm at at the moment but i you know i'm trying to understand it temporally at the moment um you know the the whole moralistic and normative and all of that is kind of coming you know one one piece at a time but really right here right now in uh in our modern world there there's corruption in what we like to believe to be the greatest democracy on the world the greatest country in the world um and even attempts at routing corruption have been corrupted you know the all of the claims of legal scandals and you know conflicts of interest and and uh, you know whatever else you know, i i know you know this this might be a little off topic but my dad's you know my dad voted for donald trump he's you know uh well donald trump was um you know he, he he's not in anyone's pocket kind of thing you know he's, he's got his own business he's a self-made whatever you know however much money he has and you know i like him because of that but even then even when having your own money he has managed to be corrupted in one way or another um as I said, with conflict of interest and his own businesses and buildings, whatever else. Um, and in reality, his attempts at routing corruption have kind of spawned a different form of corruption, at least uh, through one point of view, where it, with enough scrutiny, one might be able to detect that, you know, the sort of hiring your buddies, uh, you know, nepotism, cronyisms happening here. But really that's uh that's where i'm at i'll see if there's anything else that i didn't exactly touch on um uh yeah i guess i would um i would just finally touch on the the instance that is uh globalization where we're able to look at so many of these other cases and understand you know oh well here's the historical here's the legal here's the political reasons for all of this coming up um but it's quite rare that we self-reflect our uh our perceptions of corruption you know back back onto back onto the united states and the senators and and every other person in power that is possibly corrupted which, you know, it's kind of ironic that we now have all this information and everything else in our modern world about the development of corruption and in places that, again, people might not have originally been interested in or will probably read, a, you know, somebody might read an article about cor corruption in Tajikistan and that may be the first time they've ever heard of it. And then that might be the last time they think about it for that entire year. Uh, it, you know, it, it, it's just interesting that we can we can see it all and yet it's kind of drowned out at this point um but yeah i i have a feeling the temporal aspect will probably be coming up a lot more um just because the world has developed so much in a particular way with you know corruption in india you know uh, the bjp having held power for so long corruption in azerbaijan um with the president having hold, held power for so long and and russia with putin having held power and and corruption or at least perceived corruption or however else in in 
American uh, politics and in American policing and the American military. And there is just a lot of self-reflection uh, that can be done here. And it'll be interesting to see, you know, what else, uh, what else we talk about, what, how, how specific these cases really get and how much we can understand both about the future uh, and, and as well as the present when it comes to denying and, and, you know, subverting efforts of corruption. Uh, but yeah, that's where I'm at. So I will leave you here and I'll most likely, you know, probably film another one uh, next week. So I will talk to you then. And thank you again, Dr. Corporal.